Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Stephanie Ramdas, and we're going to be speaking about the Myopia Master in Practice on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. First, I want to say thank you to Oculus for their support of this episode and for the Myopia podcast. And as mentioned, we're joined by Dr. Stephanie Rumdas. How are you today, Stephanie? It's good to see you again. Thanks. You too, Dave. Excited to be on the show and talk all things myopia today. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you had just uh, crushed it over the last couple of years. Tell us uh, what you've been up to, uh, you know, since COVID, I guess. I haven't mm-hmm. spoken to you since before COVID. I know COVID, COVID was the year that everything changed, right? Uh, so I decided to open a private practice the end of 2020 yeah. and um, went into uh, three months of restoration and, and construction build out. And then February 2021, we opened with the intention of having a private practice that was focused on uh, subspecialties and providing a level of care to a community that otherwise was without it. So here we are now, two plus years later. Very cool. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the myopia component and how that's Mm -hmm. grown in just uh, the last couple of years. I think for me, because and I mean, I'm going, I always would come back and say, I'm a recent grad, I'm a recent grad. So I'm not 10, this is my 10th year out. (laughs) Um, And I really, at the time, um, myopia was not even in our curriculum, at at least managing it in the sense of what we know of in modern day management of myopia. Um, And so it really wasn't until I started my residency that I started um, gaining interest in myopia control and then staying at the, uh, on to work at the Michigan College of Optometry, really kind of delve like knee deep into um, you know, research in the arena of myopia and how to slow it down and the methods to, um, you know, halt the progression if possible. Um, Got a little bit on the industry side of things. And I just feel that since then, it's just as anything in the, in, in the eye care industry has just taken off in the last decade. So my goal was to open a practice where I could bring back some of the work that I had done in the U.S. Um, I know right now I, there is a surge in Canada specifically because of all of the options we have to slow myopia here, but um, a lot of the general interest in education and the clinics to slow myopia kind of started based in the U.S. So yeah, it's been an interesting U.S.-Canada uh, flip-flop for me to to. How, wait, so you practice. opened the doors. Yep. How did you start getting myopia patients in? Like how, how did you, yep. how did you advertise I mean, that? And truthfully, get them in? it just takes one, right? It just takes one really good experience. Uh, one of my mentors really just kind of honed that in with me. Um, I didn't need 20 to walk through the door and I just searched within my own circle. And so these were friends of friends that had kids that were myopic, um, parents were myopic. They didn't know anything about my, like the fact that they could put their kids in something other than glasses just to, to, you know, clear their vision. And so I started off doing some podcasts with them where we would ask questions back and forth. Um, and yeah, it was eye opening to them. That was my first set of patients in. And then since then I've kind of built off of that kind of momentum. Mm-hmm. So if you are seeing a kid who's not myopic what are some things like risk factors that you're like hey this could become myopia are there some things that heading into it or do you wait till they become myopic yeah no at this point in time i think we know enough that um from from most studies that are out there uh that look at that pre-myopic phase and you know building on that conversation of course if i have a, a child who's you know, four to five and outside of age expected norms for um, their refractive output and their parents are sitting in the chair with a minus four and a minus seven. I always ask for parental um, and sibling based uh, refractive status. Then, yeah, we start the conversation and potentially start treatment, um, which could be as simple as lifestyle changes. And it could be simple as um, discussing how to take breaks during screen time, um, 
So environmental um, impact for sure is part of my initial treatment phase. I still call that treatment because yes, we are still discussing how to mitigate any potential effects down the road with progressive yeah. myopia. Yeah, and I think if we start looking at um, you know axial length, we'll dig into that. If we see yep. that an axial length is is bigger than it should be, we know that some of the fastest rate of progression for axial length happens before they become myopic of in course. their power, right? Of course, yeah. right. Absolutely. Did you dig into axial length right away when you opened your practice? Was that something that right at the start you jumped into? I did because the um, the background, knowing that um, it was something that I wanted to be monitoring my patients with and give the full picture um, mm -hmm. and practicing myopia management where you can uh, manage not just those, you know, established myopic patients, the pre-myopes. I think it's really important. We do practice a variety of modalities here in the practice. So something like a contact lens modality, if we're going to talk about ortho K, I, I do want that axial length to be a part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it's the metric that honestly, a lot of parents walk in here and that's the one they're most nervous about. That's the one they want to know, has it changed? Where are we now? Um, so it's been great to be able to bring that a uh, piece of, of information to them because it really does kind of give a, a full package of myopia control here. Yeah. And, you know, in starting a practice, you knew you needed to buy an autorefractor or something that keratometry and axial length. Course. And that's, uh, you know, something similar where I was like, I just, I just don't need another piece of machinery that I just know. does one thing. Right. And what you know, there are several that are out there that do axial length in addition to other things. How did you come to the decision to do the myopia master? I think so. It does have the autorefractor ability in there as well, but the education component, because the software mm. allows me to take my measurement, um, repeated measures, um, input it into a software where I can show progression easily on a screen. And for me, what takes it home is communication with the parent. Typically, mom walks in the door um, and they want to visualize where my child is now and where they could be going. Um, there are some parents that walk in and they know exactly what questions to ask, but the ones that don't, the they, it can be overwhelming. It can be really scary. And so I do incorporate a measurement of axial length during baseline eye exams if I feel it's necessary just to drive my point across from an education standpoint. I won't necessarily... Yeah bill for it in that appointment if it's just part of my education. Um, but we can get into that a little bit later yeah. as to how I no, I agree. Actually, we 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 started doing it on all of our eye exams. We have everybody run through the ax you know, the auto okay. refractor for for everything. And so we just decided to turn it on. We maybe yeah. don't do tons of measurements, but just a couple of them. And yeah. even in the adults, because it's been like, oh, wow, you, you have a really high refractive, like a really a high axial length, but your refraction is like a minus a half. Oh, I had LASIK, right? So sometimes yeah. they don't even yeah. jump into yeah. telling yeah. us those things. And, uh, you know, we it's look true. and the other thing that's really cool to see, well, not cool to see, but is that those larger axial lengths, they do in fact tie in with, you know, our patients who have pathology and it just mm -hmm. brings up a, hey, well, you know, this is why we need to be, you know, you know, we need to be talking with kids or people that, you know, and the importance of reducing those risk factors, it just opens those doors for additional education, I think is, is, is really awesome. So, so that's from the screening standpoint, do you kind yeah. of, do you do a, 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 a screening or a consultation on patients? Yeah. Is that something that you have as part of your, your myopia management process I, as a consultation of some sort? I do. Um, so even if I do introduce it during that baseline eye exam, I do bring patients back for a designated myopia consultation visit where yeah. I will repeat that test and kind of hone in. I mean, half the things we talk about sometimes go out the door when the patients leave. So I do feel a dedicated time period for them to, for parents to, to get a little bit more comfortable with me. Um, that gives them another touch point with me that we can reiterate what we found, um, where we're going. We confirm prescription. We go over axial length again, what it means. Um, and we discuss all options. I think it's important to know that there's not just one single way that you can treat myopia. It's kind of individualized treatment based on the patient that presents in that chair. Um, their their environment, their um, family lifestyle, how how easy the parent can incorporate whatever treatment plan we're talking about. I think it's 
it's a lot. It's a lot that you cannot discuss in a baseline eye exam. No. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do due diligence and give it time. No, I agree. And we wouldn't start somebody on glaucoma medications at during an eye exam. We wouldn't, you of know, course. we wouldn't start, uh, do a scleral lens fitting for keratoconus. To, you know, no. we bring those people back and that allows yeah. there to be time. How do you get them back? Right. So, mm -hmm. Hey, mom has never heard of myopia management. Right. Jimmy is a minus 50. He still right. saw 2020 on the eye chart. Does he really need glasses? Right. Mm -hmm. But he's six years old. Mm -hmm. Like can, Dr. Ram, just can't can we just get glasses? Like, you know, how do you get them back? Yeah. So I always bring back such a patient in. So not necessarily a myopia management consultation. I just seen them back in three months. I was like, we're going to, if I notice there's any hesitation um, in what I'm trying to say, or it seems in a short period of time, you don't want to make it seem as if it's like where this information came from all of a sudden. So I just see them back. I see them back in three months. We do a recheck of the prescription. Um, and at that point, I'll definitely include an axial length measurement if we didn't do it in the first um, set. Um, so it inches our way to what the ultimate, um, you know, uh, effect is, which is to treat. But you have to kind of gauge. I, I've been in a situation before where I tried to kind of cram in everything. And this was before I opened the practice um, into one slot. And the there was a little bit of a language barrier between myself and mom. And it was it did not end well. She was crying. She kind of grabbed her kid. She ran out the door. She didn't understand what was going on. And I vowed to myself, I will do whatever it takes to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I think you just got to give it some time. Um, yeah. it, it won't be done in 15 minutes for sure. So yeah. I also follow up with an email sometimes if I, if uh. I feel like that baseline eye exam is leading to something that could be more, um, I will follow up with, here's a little bit of what we talked about. We're going to discuss it back at your follow-up, or we're going to discuss it back at your consultation visit. It's just touch points. I mean, I know it takes a lot more out of our day, but here's the thing. It was a cold start practice. So mm. I had a little bit of my time on my hands to yeah. kind of perfect the package. Yeah. But, you know, it, but to that point is the perfection. Mm. Once you get it, it doesn't yeah. take that much time. We no. do an exam. We have quick taken axial length on everybody. I can look at that axial length. I can compare it to age norms. I can say, right. here's what concerns me. And when you say that, it just mm -hmm. gets people's ears perked up a little bit. There's something a little concerning. We need to look a little bit closer at. Yeah. Here's what's concerned me. Johnny's eyes are growing a little bit faster than we expect, and we don't want it to get too stretched out. I'd like to bring Johnny back and do a couple of other tests uh, when he picks up his glasses or, you know, in, in a couple of weeks or a week mm -hmm. or two from now, and just see if there's anything that we can be concerning. There may be some things that we can do to slow down that progression. And so let's get Johnny scheduled back so we can really figure out what's going on. And then yeah. in the meantime, I can send him an email. Um, we've got, we, we part of Treehouse Eyes and we've got videos that we send patients that educate them on things that they're going to hear about. That way, the next appointment is far quicker, far faster, far right. easier. Right. And everybody right. is set up for success in that appointment. But mm -hmm. I love what you mentioned is that regardless, you bring those people back for that three month check. If they say no, that doesn't mean they're done, right? No. It's just, they're coming back every three months in yeah. my office or probably in yours, they're coming yeah. back in three months until they quit coming back. I know. Do you charge them for that three month appointment or do you just do that as a, a free check? What do you do? Yeah. So, I mean, in Ontario at least, so um, anybody who's under the age of 20 is covered by OHIP here. So that's our um, health insurance plan. Um, so for them, uh, especially parents, it's a non out-of-pocket expense. It's considered a recheck at that point. And so you can bill for that follow-up. Now, if it's the case where it, it would not be insurance, I think for me, it'd be a little bit more difficult to bring them back. How do you, do you guys go ahead and charge for those visits? Yeah, but that's the beauty about the myopia yeah. master, right? So the myopia master, we're able to just get that data real quick. We able to pop in the exam room and say, hey, it's still progressed. Yeah. And that's of a concern. If the patient is already in myopia management, we don't always even see them. They just come in, they get that measurement, they walk out. We just check mm -hmm. is everything going the way we want. And then, you know, boom, we're done. But just with that quick check, you know, and the reason why is if we get them back, 
and they yeah. do progress, we know that there is a high probability that they're going to move forward with treatment. If we Correct. can show them yeah. two or three or four data points Repeat and measure. Yep. where it is increasing, right? The yep. mom is convinced enough that yeah she or, or, or the dad brought them back. Yeah. And so it lays that foundation that there's a high probability they move forward. So we just do it as a no cost, quick check as part of the myopia progress, right? Yeah, I think at that point, you have to be able to understand kind of the return down the end. Um, and, you know, it's easy for us to populate a value in our charts, but uh, I don't know about you, I use the software all the time where I can show them those, you know, points as we accumulate our um uh, acquiring them on the myopia master. So it's Just great to, to explain, see the chart. Explain that a little mm -hmm. bit. What are that we don't have video for everybody of to course, watch, but what course. are those, what are the, what's included in it and what are those charts? Describe what you're yeah. meaning. So there are the age expected charts of where we would uh, see refractive error for that patient's age. And then um, specifically uh, the for, uh, the Oculus teamed up with uh, BHVI, so the Brighton Holden Vision Institute, to incorporate their software into the instrumentation. Um, and it looks at trends over time and how we can project going forward. Um, if we were to do no treatment at this point in time, uh, where do we expect that axial link to go? And, you know, it all is uh, um, associated with risk. If we see that axial length um, outside of the norm, um, how uh, much is that patient at risk? in their, uh, for their myopia to progress and then lead to long-term damage, myself included. I, I, with myopia master, I got it installed. And when I did, the first thing I did was measure my axial line because I didn't know it. Um, I myself um, showed up as over 26 millimeters. Um, and so, yeah, I've had pathology myself and it really does um, have pinpoints where I can show them at this date, here's the axial length here based on age. And then going forward, um, you can, it's easier than to tell the number at a follow-up visit rather than show it on an uh, an ascending graph for yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, you can just track where that kid is and where they're progressing. Yep. If they don't move forward with myopia management, you can just show them that trend line of where they yep. should be, where they yep. are and where they are heading. Mm -hmm. And that's both risky for the refractive error of where they mm -hmm. will be, but also the axial length of where that kid will be over time. The reason we care about that 26 number that you pointed out is because mm -hmm. it, uh, we've got a about a 25% of visual impairment if your axial length is yep. over 26. If it's over 30, you've got a 90% risk. If you're under 26, you've got a 3.8% risk. So that 26 number is kind of our our big cutoff that we care a whole bunch about. So, so we've got these percentages and so forth with axial length. Is there anything that you've particularly customized within mm -hmm. the your myopia master to make it more of yours or something you like? Is there anything on those on that side? Um. So the software. I think you like... can put your logo in there. Oh, okay. Is yeah. that something you've yeah. done, or is that? Uh, so yeah. you can, if you're going to print a report. Um, I I would send it to patients and like follow up emails. For example, parents like to see that as, you know, where has my child been and how far have they come? I think it's important. Oh, yeah. I included at like a one year follow up, um, kind of a comprehensive report on how they've done. And yes, you can customize software in that printout to show that here is our practice, here's our um, logo there. So you you can brand it, you can brand it, incorporate for your own. And that's really nice, right? Because if you do print that data out, it really shows that you know what you're doing. And, you know, myopia management, a lot of times to people seems just as a, you know, a different pair of glasses or yeah. as a contact lens but now you're creating value and that value makes mm -hmm. a higher fee seem right. more worth it. We know that our, our time is worth the value for ortho yeah. K or soft multifocals or spectacles atropine, but mm -hmm. you know, those additional things that you, you bring to the parent really helps your, your, your practice be better. What, uh, what tips would you give to anybody else who's thinking about myopia management? Uh, would you recommend axial length? And, and, and I, I would, I presume you yeah. would as well. Any tips yeah. or thoughts? I think at this point in time, 
you know, it, because the, the modes of treatment are so accessible, it's easy to start incorporating it without axial length. I will say that. Um, however, I think if you're going to be serious about it and you want to um, allow, you know, what's going to make you stand apart from the practice next door that's going to do soft multifocal lenses or myopia uh, soft lenses, um, I think you need to have that comprehensive package and um, communication. You need to be able to reiterate to patients where we're at, where we're going, and where we potentially will be in the future if we don't do any change. And that's the the software that's included in the Myopia Master makes it easily, um, it, the way you can educate, I think it just takes minutes um, as opposed to needing to have patients explain and not understand and walk out the door and go somewhere else. So yeah. um, I think the turnover point is, is a little bit faster when you have kind of that education to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it really provides us tools so we can help mm -hmm. better educate patients and parents, which really is, is huge. It's quick, it's fast, it's easy. It's, um, you know, made with children in mind, whereas yeah. maybe the IOL master is made for cataract patients with them in mind. So mm -hmm. uh, a, a really cool software. Well, excellent. I appreciate your perspectives on this. Time flew by as I knew it would. Mm -hmm. um, any closing remarks? Thanks a lot for being on the podcast. No, no, at this point in time, I mean, incorporating myopia here has, I've watched it kind of grow over the last 10 years. And I mean, I feel still like I'm a baby in this field. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to kind of see this instrument take off and, and more, um, practitioners incorporate myopia management into their practice. So yeah, great absolutely. point for education and it'll bring those patients in for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for being on the podcast and thank you for listening to this episode. Special thanks to Oculus for their support of the Myopia podcast and uh, all that we're doing here in this episode. And please join us next time for additional episodes. Make sure to like, subscribe, and if you would be so kind to share this with a friend so we can share the information about myopia management. Thank you. One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.